one. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, guys, all right. So I learned this from a very young age. So if someone says hello, you have to say hello back. So I'll try it again. Hi, everyone. Thank you. All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, today's a very special day. Today we're celebrating the launch of Pan-Africanism, a history. Um, this, well, the relaunch by 1804 Books, this book has been a key text for just understanding the origins of Pan-Africanism. And I'm extremely honored to be standing in front of you all today because the author of this book, Hakim Adi, is a very dear comrade of the space and the People's Forum, and I had the honor of meeting him this summer when we had our course, Pan-Africanism and the Struggle for Our Future. Um, we got to study the origins, the historical origins of the Pan-African struggle for liberation, both you know the historical origins and then the contemporary movements today, and it's clear that the struggle for liberation across the African continent, continent is key and crucial to all of our struggles. I mean, that's where we're literally seeing the fight the battle lines, the front lines against capitalism and imperialism. Um, and this book really lays it out beautifully, the origins of this, this socialist horizon that we're pushing for that is key in the, Afri the Pan-African uh, struggle for liberation. So thank you all so much for joining us. We're excited to celebrate the launch of this book. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our guest today. So first we have the author Hakim Adi, who is an award-winning author, activist, and historian who specializes in the history of Africa and the African diaspora particularly the focus of communism and pan-Africanism on anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles across the world. Then we have Rahel Kasahun, who is the founder of the Africa Unbound Center, an organization dedicated to promoting a culture of excellence rooted in African identity. So we have quite a treat for us today, and I'm really excited. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to our folks online for joining us. If at any point you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll pass them along here. So I'll pass it over to you all. Thank you, and um, before we begin and uh, we begin our conversation, I just want to thank all of you for coming out on this wet Tuesday evening. Um, it's a special occasion, as you've heard, because we're relaunching this English edition of uh, Pan-Africanism, a History. It's was originally published some years ago and then went out of print. Since then, it's been translated into French, Portuguese, soon to be translated into Arabic and Spanish. And so we had many translations, but not an English text. So it's great that it's now available in English again. Many thanks to everyone at People's Forum, 1804 Books, especially Kate, who's uh, spearheaded the uh, publication of this new edition. And what we're going to do tonight is just to talk about some themes which emerge from the book um, and the history of Pan-Africanism, <coughs> and then we'll open it up to any questions or comments from those of you who are here and also from those who are online. Hi to everybody who's online too. So, Rahel, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Thank you very much for coming here and thank you, People's Forum, for having us for this conversation. Uh, my name is Rahel Kasahun. I am the founder of the Africa Unbound Center based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, we also, part of the center is the, as a very unique Pan-African museum, the Africa Unbound Museum. So if you come to Addis, make sure you stop by and see us. Um, so it's a great uh, honor to be here today to, for the second, is this, I'm sure it's been launched before, but uh, for the relaunch of this Pan-Africanism, a history by Professor Hakim Adi. Um, thank you very much for writing this book. It's been described as a page turner, and I agree, I really enjoyed reading it. And I'm very much looking forward to delving in, and uh, please think of your questions. Uh, we have a small 
group, so uh, we'll have time, I'm sure, to uh, take your, all your comments and questions and uh, have a nice conversation about this book. So my first question to you, what gap were you trying to fill when you decided to write a book on Pan-Africanism? Uh, well, thanks for that question. Um, the book was really written because I had taught a course on the subject to students for many years, but there wasn't a, uh, a really up-to-date text on the subject. Um, and so that was the main reason for writing it, to have something which my students could use and the general reader could use and was up to date, um, at least up to the, the founding of the African Union, um, and had some other kind of contemporary uh, references. Most of the books that have been written on Pan-Africanism were written in the last century, there may be one or two this century, but this, this one is really the first survey of the whole history produced in the 21st century. So that was really the idea of, of writing, writing it. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with this, uh, s something that I noticed in your introductory uh, chapter. You talk about uh, a historian um, at Oxford University, uh, who in 1980, okay, oh, 1963, still. In 1963, he talked about Africa. In fact, I'm just gonna quote uh, what, you said, what he said here. He said, perhaps in the future, there will be some African history to teach, but at present there's none or very little. There's only the history of the European and Africa. The rest is largely darkness. So of course, this is not the first time. Hegel, uh, 130 years earlier, in 1830, had uh, written about um, how Africa has no history and wrote about Africa actually in a, a very derogatory terms and said, we will dismiss, and this is in, a, in his book, The History of uh, the history of the world. Well, it's 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 about the history of the world. Uh, the title of it is uh, the philosophy of history, actually. And he said uh, in in the very first uh, in the introductory chapter, he in a few a few chapters, I mean a few pages, he just uh, completely uh, dismissed the entire history of Africa and said, Africa has no history. There is no movement. Uh, nothing has ever happened. And at this point, we will leave Africa not to come back to it again. And um, so history, ha the, uh, the history of Africa has been talked about and written in this way in a long time. And what surprised me is this, is, uh, this was said by um, someone who was teaching at Oxford University in 1863. And by then, 1963, sorry. Uh, by then, of course, um, we've had many uh, prominent historians like Sheikh Ante Diop who have been publishing about the African, about African history, the culture, the heritage, the history of uh, the pre-colonial pre history um, in Africa. So my question to you is, um, when historians write like this, in this way, um, what I I are they not aware of uh, are they not really, do they not know that there is so much has happened in history or is it part of a concerted effort to um, teach or preach that Africa has no history? What is the, what's the motivation? Well, it's difficult to um, talk about individuals necessarily, but um, some of you will remember just a few years ago the president of France, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, made a very similar statement actually in, in West Africa, where he said essentially that nothing had ever happened in Africa, nothing. Um, so a very similar kind of statement as the one that you just heard and the one uh, made by Hegel and so on. I think if you look um, 
throughout history, certainly the history of the last 500 years or so, that denial of Africa's history, the denial of the, the humanity of Africans, um, is a kind of repeated topic. Um, many of the major philosophers, European philosophers, have made similar statements. One could list them and go on and on and on. Um, so these statements, thank you, these statements are, can't be separated from the, um, the impact of human trafficking, enslavement, uh, colonial invasion, colonial rule, from the uh, impact of the imperialist system of states on Africa and on Africans on the global scale. In other, wor in other words, it's the justification for the exploitation and oppression of Africans and the denial of the humanity of Africans is um, part and parcel of that attack that's being waged not just on the African continent but as I say on Africans globally. So what we think of as anti-African racism, these kind of comments are a very central part of it. And in fact the um, attack on history um, continues. I don't want to talk about my own situation, but um, I've also recently lost my position as a professor of the history of Africa and the African diaspora in Britain. Um, the course that I taught, which was also on the history of Africa and the African diaspora, was scrapped and so on. So the, these attacks continue um, today in, in Britain and in the US. As many of you know, there are also attacks on history, and particularly on the history of Africans or those of African heritage in this country. So that is the, if you like, almost the norm for this um, capital-centered world in which we live, that a part of it is, uh, an integral part of it is anti-African racism. So as far as Pan-Africanism is concerned, it's always been a central feature of uh, Pan-African thinking and action uh, to combat that anti-African racism. The book, one of the first people I mention in the book uh, is one of the first Pan-African organizations that's mentioned in the book um, are the Sons of Africa, an organization formed in, in England in the 1780s, which included a man called Alado Equiano. Some of you may have heard of him. And his famous autobiography or narrative. And one of the key things about that autobiography, there are two things. One is that he refers to himself as the African. He affirms his Africanness, one of the first piece persons to do that in the English language. And secondly, he defends the humanity and the history of Africa. In fact, the first chapter of that book is, is precisely a defense of that uh, history of African society, of African culture, of African civilization, and so on. And throughout the history of Pan-Africanism, that has been a central feature, this defense of Africa's history, African culture, and so on. So from the 18th century and throughout the 19th century, the 19th century people talked about vindication, the idea of vindication of Africans. So people in the book like Edward Blyden, um, like uh, James Africanus Horton, like anyway, one can go on and on and on, and you also mentioned Sheikh Anto Diop and others. So this defense of Africa and Africans from a historical perspective is a very central part of the kind of pan-African tradition and it extends to this day. And this struggle over history and over the falsification of history, of course the falsification of history does, doesn't just impact on Africans because the history of other people has been denied. The First Nations in this country, their history has been denied. The history of other pe people have, is denied. It's a feature of kind of Eurocentric thinking. And as I say, it's always been something which has been uh, combated through the Pan-African movement. And of course, as a, a historian, one of the 
jobs that we as historians have is to do, is to um, defend, if you like, the honesty of the historical accounts and to refute all this uh, disinformation, falsification, distortion of history. Um, anyway, that's certainly what I try to do in this book. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, there, were, there are mainly two strands of Pan-Africanism. The first one developed during the transatlantic slave trade uh, by Africans in the diaspora. And then the second uh, mostly uh, has developed on the continent after 1945, the Manchester Pan uh, uh, Congress, Pan-African Congress. And uh, you state here, the more recent continental form of Pan-Africanism is likely to include the peoples and state of North Africa, the earlier form sometimes does not. So uh, is that because the uh, people, particularly the Arabs and the decision makers of the Northern African countries, uh, they themselves did not identify as Africans? Uh, because that has been a major issue on the continent because, um, because of the racism, uh, because of the racism that is being practiced uh, in, uh, against black Africans in that region. Um, and also, you know, uh, particularly if you look at some of the global institutions uh, that deal with different regions in, in, uh, of the world, there is Sub-Saharan Africa, and then there is MENA, or Me Middle East and North Africa. So um, I found this very interesting. So what, how, why do you think uh, it's, this is the case? Uh, and the, the earlier version did not, sometimes did not include Northern African countries. OK, well, let's, let's start with the last bits first. Because um, it is true that the enemies of Africa attempt to divide the continent into various parts. Um, and this whole notion of sub-Saharan Africa and some other part of Africa is one of those attempts, as if there's uh, some war between the northern part of Africa and the southern part of Africa. So historically, there is no war. Um, and in fact, historically, if you go back far enough, um, the Sahara as it exists today didn't even exist. Um, we go back 10,000 years and so on, it was green and people moved all around it and through it and lived in it and so on. So that's the first thing, that this is a kind of distortion of the history of Africa. The second thing is that the enemies of Africa view Africa through a kind of Eurocentric lens and so and view the world through a Eurocentric lens. So one of the ways in which they view it is to talk about something called the Middle East. So what is this thing? There's no continent called East. Uh, there's Asia and there's Africa. So yes, there's Western Asia, there's North Africa, and so on. So this is very, very simple. But the, as I say, when you look at these things from a Eurocentric perspective, then there are all these divisions and strange names and confusion and so on. <clears throat> so then we come to what I said, these two major, really two major time periods as far as Pan-Africanism is concerned. And I presented it like that just to uh, give a, an orientation, a way of looking at the Pan-African movement. And it's true that if we look at the early Pan-African movement, it tended mainly to be developed amongst those in the diaspora, we can say particularly those who were educated in the Western tradition, often those who came out of a Christian tradition of one sort or another, and they tended to look at Africa in a particular way and also to look at others like themselves. So if you look at those networks that developed in the 19th century, for example, and even early 20th century, they tended to be mainly Anglophone. They were based in North America. They were based in the Caribbean. They were based in South Africa. They were based in West Africa. They were based in Europe, particularly in Britain. And they tended to look at Africa 
uh, in a particular way, um, particularly emphasizing the connections between them. And of course, mo most of those who found themselves in the diaspora as a result of uh, human trafficking and enslavement originated from West Africa. And one of the important aspects of Pan-Africanism in the early period was the idea of return, of repatriation, and people necessarily thought of returning to those parts of Africa where either they had been kidnapped from or where their families had been kidnapped from and so on. So people gravitated to places like Sierra Leone, to Liberia, and so on. And so the kind of Pan-Africanism that developed developed around these regions and also around particular kinds of ideas of who Africans were, um, some of them very strange ideas, uh, which we won't necessarily go into now, but anyway, some quite strange ideas. Um, for example, Marcus Garvey, when he was uh, developing his work, talked about civilizing the backward tribes of Africa. That was one of the aims of Garvey. So nowadays you wouldn't think about it in that way. So what was important in the early period was combating anti-African racism, defending the humanity and history of Africans, uniting people of African heritage who <laughs> appeared to be in certain parts of the world and so on, and getting people together and speaking with one voice. Um, as I say, that was mainly conducted by people in the diaspora. So in the period in the 20th century, particularly after the Second World War, we find a kind of upsurge of the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggle in Africa itself. And if we look at where that struggle was waged most violently or most successfully and in... Uh, historically in a very early period, it often occurred actually in North Africa. And some of the countries of North Africa were actually led that anti-colonial struggle in terms of, you know, their armed struggle and so on. So one of those countries would obviously be Algeria, uh, which happens to be in North Africa. Another would be Egypt, which also happens to be in North Africa. And there are others like Morocco and so on. And if you look at those countries and the struggles that they waged, if we look at Algeria as an example, <coughs> Algeria became a kind of centre of, not only of African anti-colonial nationalism, but a centre of pan-Africanism. So if you read Malcolm X, he talks about his experiences when he went to Algeria and how important it was in his development. He also actually talks about his experiences in Egypt and so on. Algeria became a kind of revolutionary centre in Africa. The Black Panthers, or one section of them under Eldridge Cleave and others, had their headquarters in Algiers and organised from Algiers. And, of course, you had this whole struggle in which one of the leading Pan-Africanists of the period, Frantz Fanon, took a central role. And so everybody recognised the importance of Algeria's struggle against French colonialism, in which so, so many people gave their lives not just to liberate Algeria, but to liberate the entire continent and so on. So in that period, it became very important to stress the anti-colonial struggle of the African continent and the unity of the African continent. And these countries, such as Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, were some of the first independent African countries, independent in the sense of waging a struggle against colonial rule, and became important centres of the Pan-African struggles. I just mentioned Algeria. Obviously, Egypt under Nasser was also a very important centre of that kind. Uh, later, of course, Libya, which is also happens to be in North Africa, also became a very important centre, we could say, against the imperialist system of states um, and actually a very important... Um, what should we say? A very important... Um, leader, really, of Pan-Africanism on the African continent, certainly in terms of the founding of the African Union, Libya, and Muammar Gaddafi played a very important role. And, of course, you could say that because of that important role, Libya was attacked by the NATO forces, particularly Britain, France, and the United States. 
the whole country devastated, uh, Gaddafi assassinated, and so on and so forth. So, we then come to these other issues. And of course, if you look at the governments which exist in many of these countries today, um, if we look at Egypt today, for example, Egypt today is very different from Egypt during the time of NASA. It's a very reactionary government. It has very reactionary policies on all kinds of things. If we look at the government of Morocco, the government of Algeria, the government of Libya, so if we can call it a government. And if we think about what happened after the NATO invasion of Libya um, and to those Africans who were there in that country from other parts of the continent, how they were treated and so on, how they were dealt with, we see very clearly that a, that country had undergone a significant change from the time when Gaddafi and others were in power and so on. So where we find negative manifestations of racism, of other attitudes, there might be anti-women, there might be all kinds of attitudes, we have to look at what is the nature of the governments and societies in which, in which these things take place. Because we also find anti-African racism in other parts of Africa. In South Africa, for example, there is, we want to call it racism against other Africans. In other parts of the continent, there are also these divisions. So we have to then look at what is going on in these countries. Uh, to look at why these things are going on, uh, whether they're dealt with appropriately, whether they're not dealt with, and so on. And this is, you know, these are the kind of problems that exist in a world which is part of the imperialist system of states and all kinds of reactionary ideas circulate and are often encouraged, particularly to create divisions amongst people, to find scapegoats, from those who are considered foreigners. Uh, the problems of this country are all about these migrants, uh, these people coming from other places and so on. So this is not a new feature. Um, and of course, the way in which Africa is presented in some of these countries um, is, is actually quite interesting. I remember the first time I went to Libya, just to give a personal example. And I imagine, I'd never... I didn't necessarily know that much about it. But thinking about Libya, I always thought that it would be a country that was kind of north-looking. That it, you'd, when you go there, everybody would be thinking about it as a Mediterranean country. And when I got there, I found it was completely the opposite. That everything was directed towards the south. Everything was looking, actually, at the Sahel region, the Saharan region, the center of the what they called the revolution in Libya was in the south. Everything was to the south. They always looked to the south. So, of course, that has changed now. So I think that we have to look at all these things in a historical context, explain actually what's going on, but recognize the important role that many of these North African countries have played in the liberation of the entire continent, the anti-colonial struggle that went on in Africa in the 1950s, 1960s, and so on. Thank you. Just to complete the historical context, you said um, when you went to Libya, Libya was uh, more focused towards Africa. Um, Gaddafi actually was not did not start as a Pan-African. He uh, he was, he was looking towards the north and the Middle East or the other Af African countries. But, and he was very, very ambitious, as you know. Um, he had great ambition. Uh, he wanted to be very influential in the region. Uh, but he did not find any reception. Uh, he didn't find the reception he was looking for in the north and in, in, in the uh, other Arab, Arab countries. Therefore, he turned his gaze towards Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and um, by investing a lot of money, the oil money, uh, he was able to get uh, the influence um, and started to uh, become, and uh, towards the end, he became a real Pan-Africanist, genuinely. Uh, but one thing that I find very, very interesting about uh, the Pan-African development 
the movement is that there were women involved f starting from very early, uh, from its inception, but we don't hear enough about them. Uh, people like Alice Victoria Kenlock. If you can tell us about her and maybe a, a couple more women that um, should get more visibility and we should know more about. Yeah, just on uh, Libya and Gaddafi. Kinlock. Yeah. Yeah, I just think on uh, Libya, I think the most important thing about the uh, investment that took place there um, was actually the investment that took place within the country. Um, because Libya had, the, I think, the highest standard of living of any country in Africa. So the oil wealth was kind of well invested, as it were. Um, but yes, on Alice Kinlock. Alice Kinlock is really the founder of modern Pan-Africanism, or the inspirer of modern Pan-Africanism. She was a South African woman who came to London, or came to Britain, not really London, came to Britain at the end of the 19th century. She came to defend the interests of her male compatriots, many of them mine workers or other workers who were being exploited by the uh, European settlers in South Africa. She went on a speaking tour of Britain and there she came into contact with the Pan-Africanists who were uh, beginning to organise themselves. And she inspired them, she encouraged them to form an organisation called the African Association, which was formed in 1897 in London, uh, including people like Henry Sylvester Williams and others. Uh, and it was that organization that held the first Pan-African Conference in London in 1900, in July 1900. So and she had already returned to South Africa uh, by that time, but her, her role was extremely important. And as I say, she can be seen as the kind of mother of, the, of modern Pan-Africanism. As you say, uh, as on many occasions, women are very often written out of history is another way in which history is distorted. Um, and that's certainly the case with Alice Kinlock. She, for more than, more than a century, was largely unknown, even in South Africa, largely unknown. It's only very recently she's become recognized for the important role that she played. There are many others. Um, <clears throat> one of the two of the images you'll see are of the two Nadal sisters. Um, uh, Jean Nadal and Paulette Nadal, who were from the Caribbean, from Martinique, and for many years lived in, in France, and were two of the founders of an important Pan-African uh, stream, we can call it, which is generally referred to as negritude, and negritude were emerged during the 1930s in, in Paris. It's normally associated with three men, uh, Leopold Senghor, Aimé Césaire, Léon Damas. But in fact, it was these two women who played a very important role in, in its development. They had a, I guess you'd call it like a salon, where they, they discussed these kinds of issues. And um, they were associated with people sometimes who came from the U.S., uh, who were connected with the Harlem Renaissance in this country, who then went to Paris and were um, in the circle of the Nadal sisters as well as others. So again, these two sisters are very often excluded from um, this very important development of the Negritude movement, which is a kind of cultural movement, a kind of cultural Pan-Africanism, a resistance to the, the policies of the French uh, colonial powers. So those would be two examples. Um, there are um, there are many others one could mention. Um, in Britain, just to give one other example, there's the a woman called Amy Ashwood Garvey, who was the first wife of Marcus Garvey, who was actually, the some would say, the joint founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica in 1914. Um, which is usually just credited to uh, Marcus Garvey himself. And just talking about the Garvey, the UNIA generally, many of the leading figures in it were women. 
um, but they often go kind of rather unrecognized. Amy Ashwood Garvey was an important figure in her own right, mainly active in Britain, but also in Jamaica, where she was involved in many organizations, including the Nigerian Progress Union, International African Service Bureau, Pan-African Federation, and many, many, many others. So there are many women that could be mentioned. Okay, moving on. Um, the title of your sixth chapter is From Ethiopia to Manchester. Of course, the, uh, the fifth Pan-African Congress held in Manchester is one of the defining moments of uh, Pan-Africanism um, the Pan-Africanism movement. Um, what would you say, well, okay, from Ethiopia to Manchester. So if you could connect uh, these moments, the invasion of Ethiopia by the Italians, uh, Second World War, and then Manchester. And with, so as you address that question, um, in their communique uh, at the end of the, 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 the Congress in Manchester, they said, we demand for black Africa autonomy and independence so far and no further than it's possible in this one world for groups and people to rule themselves subject to inevitable world unity and federation. What did they mean by that? And what would you say was is is the main outcome of that uh, Congress? Okay, that's a very <coughs> very lengthy question, but I'll try to summarize it. So I think the importance of the the in invasion of Ethiopia by fascist Italy in mid nineteen thirties nineteen thirty five was important in that it kind of galvanized the pan-african movement of the day it brought everybody together um it was one of those uh defining movements actually that played a particularly important role for example in france of bringing people from different parts of the african continent together from north africa from west africa from madagascar all united together during the 1930s on that particular issue and it, um, <clears throat> it was part of the, some people see it as uh, the start of a new upsurge in the anti-colonial struggle in Africa as well as in the, the diaspora. Of course, it coincided with other things going on in the Caribbean with labor uprisings and many other things going on elsewhere as well as and so on. But it, it definitely um, kind of galvanized people into a new upsurge of struggle in Africa. And that struggle was kind of slightly diverted by the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> but um, diverted in the sense that it was slightly perhaps delayed by the Second World War. Um, but the war itself then accelerated the anti-colonial uh, impetus, we can say. Why? Well, because... The major colonial powers were weakened by the war. The British, the French, Belgians and others were much, much weaker as a result. Secondly, the war ushered into being two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, who were both, for different reasons, anti-colonial. Uh, thirdly, the peoples of the world had defeated fascism. So there was a tremendous... Uh, almost euphoria about a new world that would emerge from the defeat of fascism. <clears throat> and so in Africa and elsewhere, that meant, as well as in Asia and other places, it meant that many people had waged a struggle, not only against the colonial rulers, but against the defeated fascist powers. But in general, there was great optimism and a feeling that if fascism could be defeated and if people had given their lives to defeat it then uh, it was high time that colonial rule was brought to an end so the manchester congress was held obviously in manchester in britain although originally it was supposed to be held in paris and it was held at a time when the all the workers the trade union centers of the world were meeting in a, in 
a founding conference, which also happened in London and Paris in 1945. So the organizers of the Manchester Congress used that event. They said, okay, the leaders of trade unions are getting together. Those are the kind of people we want to organize amongst. In they included people like a guy called Isaac Wallace Johnson, who was a Sierra Leonean trade union activist who'd actually been imprisoned by the British during the war. People like Ken Hill in Jamaica had also been imprisoned during the war. These people were brought out of prison and taken to this conference in London. And so the organizers, the Pan-African Federation in Britain said, okay, this is an opportunity. We can get these guys together. We can get some other people together. We can have a completely different kind of Pan-African Congress. Not those of the past, which have just been a few professors and lawyers and other people, but this will be a real congress of workers, leaders, of farmers, leaders, and so on. So that was the idea of the congress in Manchester, and it happened just as the war ended with all of this optimism and determination and so on. And so they met, and then they, they really summed up the previous period and they learned from the previous period what had been the main force to change things in the world. They said it's the, work, it's the workers. Those who create all the wealth, they are the ones, if they stop work, everything comes to a standstill. And in fact, on the eve of the Congress, there was a general strike in Nigeria, one of Britain's largest colonies in Africa. It brought the whole colony to a standstill. So they said... At the Congress, they said, look, if we organize amongst the workers, amongst the farmers, there's nothing that can stop us. So this was a kind of new direction for Pan-Africanism. And as you heard, um, as Rahel read out, <coughs> they issued a number of statements. One, they said they had a kind of vision of a new Africa. They said this Africa will be uh, without colonial borders. It will be without the political institutions of colonial rule, what they called alien political institutions, and it will be without the capital-centered economic system. So the particular quote you heard then was that, yes, there should be unity, unity and sovereignty for Africa as part of, if you'd like, world unity. So their pan-Africanism was an internationalist pan-Africanism. Uh, just before the Congress met, they organized subject people's conferences, which included those from Asia, from India, from Sri Lanka, from other countries in Asia, because they said those people who are oppressed by colonial rule need to work together. At the Congress itself, one of the most important slogans was labor in the white skin cannot emancipate itself while labor in the black skin is enslaved. And in fact, the Congress was directed, partly directed at the working class in Britain. So they, their thinking was that we need to unite with all those other people who are also struggling against our common enemies, if they're in Asia, if they're in Britain, wherever they are. So this idea of world unity, well, or world federation, was a kind of idea of a new world, a new world which would be the world of the working people, the working masses, those who created all the wealth. And at that time, people even thought that the workers would have a seat on the Security Council of the UN. That was the thinking of the time, because it was the working people who defeated fascism, who'd done everything in the war and so on. So this is the kind of captures the spirit of those times and how people thought this new world would emerge from the ruins of fascism and so on. And so, yes, this idea of world unity, um, independence, but within a united world, everybody working together and then that was the kind of thinking of that time. So turning to culture for a moment, um, your ninth chapter is titled African culture is revolutionary or it will not be. What does that mean? Mm, that's a good one. Well, during this post-war period, there were um, a number of Pan-African cultural events that occurred in different places. Um, and the characteristics of these festivals, um, of course, differed 
depending on where they were held and who held them and so on. So there was, for example, there was a Pan-African Culture Festival, one of the first that was held in, in Dakar, and in which uh, Leopold Senghor was one of the key f uh, f figures, shall we say. Um, and of course, it, it, it uh, what shall we say, it encouraged various ideas associated with negritude and so on and so forth, which is, we could say negritude is really a kind of celebration of of blackness. I'm putting it very simply, but that's the essence of it. Then we had a Pan-African cultural festival in Algiers. I mentioned the importance of Algeria earlier. So the Pan-African cultural festival in Algiers had a different character. It... Uh, included many of the liberation organizations that were then fighting for independence. In fact, one of the most important um, participants was Amical Cabral. And you'll see one of the photos, I think, is up here of, of Cabral um, meeting an important guest from the United States, who also happened to be in Algiers. We'll see if people can spot who that is when the photo goes up. Um, so there, the question of culture was discussed. It's not the first time it had been discussed because it had also been discussed at the um, the Black Writers' Congress that had been held in Paris in 1956. <clears throat> and then there was a, another, another congress which was held in Rome a couple of years later. The question really was what kind of culture is needed? Uh, do you just have a culture that kind of celebrates being black, for example, again, I'm simplifying things, or do you have a culture that re re relates to the kind of struggles that people are waging uh, to get rid of the colonial power, for example? And what does that culture need to be like? And of course, some of you will be aware that Abakal Cabral wrote a very important essay on these kinds of questions, that culture needs to be that which assists people to solve the, the problems that they face. And Fanon also wrote similar essays. Um, and in fact, the, the Congress is in, in Paris and, and, uh, and Rome. Fanon was, one of the, again, one of the main protagonists. What kind of culture do we need? So it needs to be a culture which unites people. It needs to be a culture which takes the best from the traditions of the people, but utilizes them in such a way that it moves forward the the struggle that's being waged and so on. So uniting people, taking the best elements, uh, inspiring people to struggle against the colonial power and so on. These were the kinds of ideas that were being discussed. Um, and so this idea of revolutionary culture, a culture which aids the national liberation struggle, which aids the struggles of the people, which puts the people at the center of things and so on, these were the kind of ideas that were being discussed. And so this uh, comment <coughs> kind of ushers in this, um, this chapter. And of course, later on, there were other manifestations of this cultural question, like, for example, the black arts movement uh, here in this country. And I don't think we've got, if we actually look at the cover of the book, this is the, the first edition of the book. This comes out of, this mural comes out of the black arts movement in this country and actually says, work to unify the African people. So you get a clear idea of what kind of culture that is. It's actually saying something. It's encouraging people to do something. It's taking up a question for solution. Rather than just uh, doing what, other types of culture can do. As culture can do many things, you know, it can be, uh, you know, help you relax. It can waste a few hours doing nothing, or it can inspire you to get up and do something uh, to change the world. Uh, it can give you examples of how people have changed the world in the past, and so on. It can be inspiring, or it can send you to sleep. So, this kind of question of what sort of culture do we need? is a very important question. If you look at, um, you know, the period of black power, for example, th these became very crucial questions. What kind of culture do we need? Do we just celebrate um, being African by, you know, putting on a dan shiki? 
or do we take up the question of what actually needs to be done to solve the problems that confront people? So, you know, we run a breakfast program for kids or we'll... So all of these are cultural questions. What kind of music? What kind of poetry? What kind of art? What kind of film? What kind of dance? What kind of everything? And sometimes we don't think about these questions. Just think, okay, well, it's just culture. But what is the what is it saying? What's its impact? What is it contributing to actually changing the world and uh, addressing the needs of people? These were the kind of questions that people were were discussing during these these cultural festivals. Okay, I'll ask one last question, and I'll give uh, the. <laughs> okay, I see. I see some of you have some burning questions. Um, in your concluding chapter, you say, many still feel the need for all those of African descent to unite, to speak and act as one in order to change the world in the interest of Africa and all of those of African heritage. So for the most part, Pan-Africanism has not, uh, has, if you, one of the criticisms is that it has not successfully united all of Africans at home and in the diaspora. But do you feel um, unity, unity of all is a precondition for significant progress? Because a lot of the progress that has been achieved, not just in Africa, but in different parts of the world, has certainly has not involved all of the people. It's impossible to unite all of the people. So I'm wondering why we're still using this kind of language when we're talking about change, uh, pr particularly progressive change. Well, I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's not necessarily a question of uniting everybody, but it's uniting those who need to be united and want to be united. Um, Let's, let's look at it in a, in a different way. Um, let's imagine that, you know, we're, we're all sitting here. I don't know whether we're all, we're all based in New York, for example. Uh, we may all be doing our thing in different places individually. Um, but we're all interested in s similar kind of issues. So the question really is, are we better off being individuals? Or are we better off being united? And I think history will show that we're better off being united. But that unity then is what kind of unity? Well, you need unity in action, not unity just sitting around saying, yeah, we're united, but united by doing something. And so I think that's important, and it's still a very difficult thing to unite people in an organized way to solve a problem is one of the most necessary things, but one of the most difficult things to do. And those people who talk about that problem, again, Amakar Cabral was very hot on that issue. How do you actually unite people in struggle to transform? Um, if you can do that, then you can, you know, you really can change the world. So I think as far as the struggle of Africa and Africans are concerned, this question of unity is still uh, important, but as I say, unity in struggle. Those who recognize the need to do something um, need to unite, organize themselves in order to, to do it, whether they're in New York or DC or Britain or Ethiopia or Nigeria or wh wherever that, that may be. I think that's important. Of course, there are other things that are crucial as well because um, there are lots of things that can kind of divert people's struggles into blind alleys and dead ends and so on so it's it's important to you know be clear what the orientation of that particular struggle is or what the aim is or how to go about it but these things are also worked out in unity and in collectives by people taking up a problem and working out how to solve it 
going through things from stage to stage and so on and so forth. So unity has its significance, its place, its importance. Um, not going around trying to get everybody singing from the same hymn sheet, but certainly, yeah, uniting to solve a problem and move things forward is definitely crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for your questions and comments. And as you said, we can open things up. If anybody has any queries, comments. Um, right. Yeah? Yeah, Let's so we, we do, you, how about we You're going to run that? Okay. I got you, you I got you, I got you. How about we take maybe two or three questions at a time, pass it over to you, and then we could do another round and see, because about 30 or so minutes. So I'll go here, and then I have another one in the room, and then we also have some questions online too. So for folks online, you can type them in the chat. All right. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with all of us today. Um, one of the things that caught my attention was the necessity of Pan African to be trans borders, both arbitrary borders imposed by uh, colonial states. Um, but my question points more towards the borders that predate uh, our colonial history. Um, I'm curious, what is Pan-Africanism's practical response to ethnic divisions and like the ethnic divides that still galvanize and motivate many people throughout the continent? Are there examples of political Pan-Africanism flourishing without subsuming ethnicity, or are those two, by definition, in contention? Okay. Oh. Um, I also want to thank you, and thank you all for being here as well. Um, my question relates to the importance that you you brought up for, uh, or actually mentioned several times, of North Africa, and how right now, as we are crucially and fiercely supporting the Palestine indigenous people, how, how as Pan-Africans and the diaspora, it's kind of our responsibility to also bring up the sovereignty of the Sudanese, so the Nubian people in Northern Africa, um, who are, have been displaced from Northern Africa by the same Arab powers that the Philistines are even asking, why aren't y'all supporting us? And I feel like it's the same reason that Gaddafi was assassinated, is that they, don't, they see them as y'all are people who organize with the niggas, and we don't necessarily want to associate y'all with us. We have family members in the East, I mean the North, uh, which are the Romans, so we speak Latin, we speak English. Um, how is it at this time that we can bring up our sovereignty without being disrespectful and not being uh, apathetic to what's going on there, but also bringing up the sovereignty of the Nubian and Sudanese people that the Arab countries are ignoring, uh, the wealthy Arab countries are ignoring, while still being in solidarity with the Arabs, uh, the poor Arabs, the working Af Arabs that are going through so much genocide at the moment. That's, yeah, okay. Um, I think that the two questions are kind of related in a, in a way. Uh, I'll take the last one first, as it were. Um, I think, to me, one of the key things is always to distinguish between states and people. So when we're talking about states, governments, um, many of these states, governments, that are, we can say, reactionary in the sense that they don't look after the interests of their own population let alone anybody else um, and the states in Western Asia for example um, who act in that way are well known um, 
they've acted not only do they act in that way they act with uh, international players including the government of this country the government of Britain and so on and again if we go back into history we can see the origin of these states uh, how they were um, or various uh, various people were placed in power um, by the old colonial powers, particularly the British and French uh, colonial powers in that region. So you have states which, um, as I say, represent very definite interests, ally with the most backward powers in the world to police that region. Um, so that's very different from, obviously, the situation of the Palestinians and so on, who are also oppressed and have also come out of the same history, as it were, and are the, um, the victims, if I can put it that way, of the colonial policies of Britain in particular, uh, but also other powers in the region and so on, and are today supported by... Um, anyway, those who are oppressing them are supported by the big powers, including... You know, the government of this country and so on. So I think once you distinguish between states and peoples, then uh, things become much clearer. In Sudan, as in many other countries, there are, as you know, there's been recent upsurge of struggle of people trying to uh, change the situation in that country and to resolve things so that uh, all the people of that country can enjoy equal rights, sovereignty, and so on. That that struggle hasn't been, hasn't come to its final conclusion, we can say, but it's the struggle of the people in that country that will resolve these questions. Um, those questions are also part of the, you know, the whole kind of way the country was colonized, the way it was ruled by Britain, and the legacy of that colonial rule, and that's the case in many um, African countries. So um, what you refer to as the um, those who have been displaced, not only not only exist in Sudan, but also in Egypt and so on. So, and are, you could say, divided by an arbitrary border that's been imposed by others. So those are... You know, questions that have to be resolved by the people of all of these countries, and the the struggle is not at that stage at this particular time. But that is the, the, the issue that needs to be addressed. That anyway, that's how it relates to your question, which is similar, I think, in that um, yes, there are. Uh, you can say tensions, maybe one way of saying it, between those people who live in different African countries, as you said. Sometimes they're divided by colonially imposed borders. That's one thing. Secondly, sometimes their rights as peoples are not recognised by the states that exist. Remember, most of these states are, not all of them, but many of them are the legacy of colonial rule. And so their arbitrarily imposed borders, they have constitutions that don't recognize um, the nations which exist within those states. Most of them are multinational states. And so all kinds of problems uh, can ensue because of that. For example, you know, resources may be taken from one part of the country where particular people abide. Uh, but they don't receive the benefit of that wealth or whatever it is. So all of these tensions which exist between people speaking different languages, people of different nations and nationalities, men, women, all of these things are the result of having states which don't recognize and guarantee the rights of the people who live in them. Uh, and the just as many other countries, not just in Africa, but also in this continent and also in Europe, have those kind of states. So I think that the issue is for 
as I said, for people to find ways of changing the situation that they face in these countries, which really means uh, how do they have, how do they secure decision-making power, the decision to, uh, the, the power to decide what kind of state they live in, uh, what rights people have in those states, uh, what connections they have with neighbouring people or neighbouring peoples. All of these questions have to be decided by the people of African countries. At the present time, people haven't decided anything. They haven't decided the borders, they haven't decided the political system, they haven't decided the economic system, they haven't decided the education system, they haven't decided the health system, they haven't decided anything. So the absence of decision-making powers to me is like the key ingredient, the key question. And then the issue is, okay, how do you get that decision-making power? How do you empower yourself in Africa? Well, we could ask the same question here. How do you empower yourself in the US? How do you empower yourself in Britain? So it's the same, the same question, and the same kinds of problems. Uh, just to give... Britain as an example, in Britain you have uh, three, four different nations uh, also demanding their rights, which at the moment are not recognised. It's no different, eff effectively. Sorry? I mean, yeah, nations. The English are a nation, the Scottish are a nation, the Welsh are a nation, the Irish are a nation. But they don't have decision-making powers, they don't enjoy sovereignty, just like in many African countries, because the state structure doesn't allow people to decide to make decisions about their own lives, what they want, who they want to be, their rights to self-determination, to sovereignty. All these questions are denied. So finding the way of solving that, again, by um, struggling to deal with these questions. Again, to go back to Cabral, it's one of the issues that he raises um because again in uh, in Guinea there were people of different backgrounds different nationalities and so on sometimes who were antagonistic to each other for historical reasons but how to unite them to remove the major problem which was Portuguese colonial rule was one of the questions that he and others took up for solution so Anyway, these, I think, are the kinds of issues that uh, are very complicated to solve, but can be solved when, as I say, people have decision-making powers. All right. We have, let me read off some from online, and then I'll come and do y'all too. Stay tuned. Get I got you. I see y'all. Um, we have one from Katie who says, if history is a roadmap, as Dr. Clark taught, how can we connect the past with the present dynamics of Africa rising and a pathway to a future of sovereign and sustainable development? Um, and another question is related to currency. Oh, <coughs> where is that? Um, related to Pan-Africanism and Africa's economics, um, what are your thoughts on Africa, Africa having a shared currency in a central bank? Well, we should pass that question to the economist here. Because we have a, an economist who can answer that question. You want to deal with that one first? Yes, that's exactly. Uh, OK. Um, we need our own currency. We need one currency. Um, Fortunately, after many, many years of discussion, it's finally happening. Uh, the African Free Trade Continental Agreement, uh, the African CTA, um, is helping make that happen. Uh, it's actually uh, one of the most exciting things that is happening on the continent today because we're working towards a common currency uh, which has not been easy. There's huge, huge amount of resistance uh, to it uh, still to this day. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very, very complicated process, very difficult one. 
um, because it has huge political and economic implications. Um, and then the other exciting thing that's happening uh, that the AU, the African Union, is driving is the, the um, um, highway that is connecting the continent, different part that's running through different parts of the continent. So um, integration is finally going to ha is happening. Uh, it's not going to. It is hap it has been happening for many years, but now with the with the uh, common currency, the move towards common currency, and then um, also the Trans-African Highway and many of the regional um, economic uh, units that are kind of harmonizing the way they do business, all of that is really helping us um, unite in ways that we haven't seen before. So that's something very exciting. Yeah. What was, what was the first question again? Thank you. Um, it was, if history is a roadmap, as Dr. Oh, yeah. Clark taught, how can we connect the past with the present dynamics of Africa rising and a pathway to a future of sovereign and sustainable development? Well, I think uh, one way of looking at it is where has there been... Uh, where has the struggle for change been move things forward and I mean there are different places different uh, in different time periods in the continent where that's occurred so we can look at the again the anti-colonial struggles that I keep referring to um, and we can look at what happens at the end of those struggles very often to see maybe where things don't go well and one of the problems is what kind of what kind of state is established um, and if you like who controls that state just to just to give an example i mentioned the 1945 pan-african congress had a vision of a new africa and part of that vision was that it was the majority of the people who would be the decision makers in the sense that it was recognized that it was the majority of people that needed to play the major role in removing the colonial powers. They were the main force that was going to move the colonial powers. So what is the kind of logic of that argument? If the people are to be the main force in, in the struggle, then the people must be the main force in the development of a new state in other words it needs to be a people's state but um you know in that period even people like Kwame Nkrumah said seek ye first the political kingdom but whose political kingdom are you seeking are you seeking the political kingdom of the majority of people or are you just seeking the political kingdom of the colonial powers? So if you struggle, 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 you get rid of the colonial rulers, but you adopt all their machinery, all their political institutions, all their state, then effectively nothing very much changes because the economic system remains the same, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and so on. And we've seen that so many times. If you look at South Africa as another example where people struggled for so many years uh, against the apartheid regime and so on, and then on the verge of victory, as it were, and if we go back to what people were demanding in South Africa and the People's Charter, land to the tiller and every, you know, all these kinds of ideas, but it didn't happen. Instead, the kind of existing state structure was just adopted. And so you find similar kind of problems. Okay, there's obviously, obviously there's been some change. But fundamentally, things have not changed because, again, going back to what I said before, the majority of people do not have decision-making power. Power relies in the hands of a few the political system remains intact, the economic system remains intact. Yes, you may have the biggest economy in Africa or one of the biggest economies in Africa, but the majority of people don't benefit from that economy um, because 
the structures, the institutions have not been fundamentally changed, and as I say, the people don't have decision-making power. So if we learn from that, the it's not just the struggle which is important, although uniting people, organizing that struggle of the masses of the people is very, very important. That's obviously the first thing that needs to be done. But then seeing that through to the end, you know, having faith in the people, developing a system which comes from the people, where they're at the centre of everything, centred decision making, that is absolutely crucial. And you have an economy which satisfies the needs of people first for all the things that people need. Water, electricity, healthcare, education, this, that, that. that's the first. But very often the opposite is done. Uh, the first interest goes to the big multinationals the second interest goes to the rich and powerful and whatever is left if there's anything then people might get a bit of that and then the whole system goes into crisis and so on so I think that there are a lot of lessons that you can see from history from as I say the vision of those in 1945 in Manchester which hasn't yet been realised um and you can analyse why it hasn't been realised and what needs to be done in the future to, to transform things. Amazing. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, so I'm going to take the three questions in person. But we do have a shout-out. Um, Ifo Ikede from Nova Scotia says, hello. Oh, wow. How's it doing? <laughs> yes, my question is, uh, as the working class grows in consciousness, especially with the uniting power of social media, do you foresee uh, within this century a time where Africans and oppressed people will be able to unite against colonial powers? Okay, all right, I'll take one. I'll take this one and then two for fun. Hello, um, thank you for uh, being here. My question was about um, how uh, places like the US, France, the UK, tout diversity as sort of a virtue, um, but it's an outcome of the colonial history. But my question was, how do l rapid demographic changes in these places and ongoing immigration um, uh, affect, or rather, what's your prognosis on how that affects um, the movement of Pan-Africanism within uh, on the continent and kind of globally as well? I got a shout out, Free Mumia. Abu Jamal, that's my shout out. Um, well, I was thinking that I wanted to also make sure that uh, you do continue to uh, mention you losing your position um, as a professor of African studies because it coincides with what's happening in Florida and De Santos, De Santos um, taking away taking away the books uh, and actually burning them and taking away African studies. So it's very important and crucial that you make that dynamic or that connection because the Europeans in Britain are the Europeans here and so forth and so on from Roman Empire on. That's why we speak Latin languages. Um, the other thing was, I was wondering if you had mentioned earlier that there was a scholar that said that there was no history in Africa, there was nothing to there's nothing to actually bring forth um, to talk about Africa. And I feel like sometimes it's that whitewashing or actually hiding, denial of hiding what actually happened in ancient times um, with the ancient Hyksos or the ancient Sumerian or Western Asian, um, which would be the, the now wealthy Arab countries um, fighting with the Romans at that time for power over Northern Africa and wondering if maybe some of the history that they don't want to necessarily discuss, if it would be in Arab languages for us to be able to understand what happened as far as invasion during that time and bringing it to present day and the connections of the families that are in, a in Western a Asia and also in Europe and so Southern Europe countries that are colonizing all of the rest of the world. Okay, this this might be um bit um this might be a bit um uh, um on a on a diff on a different topic to the others is that when you um mentioned how in um how early in pan early in, in um pan Africanism and around the eighteen around the 
around the seven late 1700s that it was mostly based on it was mostly um um embodied by Af by for enslaved or f formerly enslaved n newly freed africans in their in your in european countries um refer reaffirming themselves as african amongst uh, amongst in their country i was wondering how um i was wondering if you ever covered how that how that kind of um how how that kind of um form of pan africanism was shaped with the um founding of ha with the founding of Haiti in North America because I what I in what I can find there was there there was at least a, a there was at least under Dessaline under the under the newly Haitian government there was more connection there was more connection or more there was an effort to connect to connect Africans in in um North America under the new regime and a lot of the early um revolts in 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 the southern in the southern states were um were were either inspired by or were directly or di or were di had the direct intention of escaping to to Haiti and there was and I'm wondering if you had any any com any commentary on that that particular peer, that particular regional history yeah yeah in fact the book um, more or less starts with um, the Haitian Revolution and its importance I mean we could say that the Haitian Revolution was a kind of pan-African act in the sense that it united Africans from different parts of the continent who, f who found themselves transported to Haiti most of those who fought in the Haitian Revolution were born in Africa so we can think of it as an African uh, revolution uh, inspired by African thought material, uh, African worldviews of different kinds. And one of the great uh, qualities of the Haitian Revolution is how people managed to combine what language did they speak, how do they combine these different cultures, different worldviews into one and sustain it for 13 years and overthrow the three principal armies in Europe and so on. So that's a very important Pan-African act or manifestation of Pan-Africanism. Um, the, the, the key thing about Pan-Africanism is that it's, uh, I say in the book, it's like a river with many different streams and currents. It's not one thing. It's based on what is required at any particular time. Um, what are the challenges facing Africans in any particular place at any particular time? What do they need to do to deal with that problem and so on? So obviously in Haiti, um, they not only liberated the, the country, as you say, but established the first real modern definition of human rights and then opened the doors of, or opened the country to um, others who needed uh, support, uh, people from the US. Uh, they obviously, they encouraged and supported uh, Bolivar and so on and encouraged him to take action in Latin America, what was Latin America and so on. So they had a very big impact. Um, uh, and Haiti became a kind of symbol of African independence, uh, just as Ethiopia did and also Liberia did. So it, it plays, as you exactly as you said, a very, very important role um, and has today a very important place within the African Union, which no other state outside the African continent has. So that's a demonstration of its, of its significance. Um, I think your question about North Africa, Europe, and so on. One of the things that we forget is that in history, everything changes. So these one thing is that the people of North Africa are not one people. Um, because everybody speaks Arabic doesn't mean everybody's the same. There are different peoples who live within this region of Northern Africa. Historically, they played a very important role. As you know, they conquered Europe and established their dynasties in Europe for some 700 years. Um, 
In fact, only a few weeks ago, I was in the south of France, and in the particular town I was staying, there was a, a old fortification, and that fortification had been built to keep the North Africans out of that part of France. This is going back to hundreds of years. So this North African conquest of Europe was extremely important uh, for the development of, actually for U development of European civilization because it brought all the learning of the ancient world, which was syncretized by the various Arab scholars of that period, uh, to Europe. So the ancient knowledge from ancient Egypt and other places and also from parts of Asia, it brought all these things to Europe, which created the basis for modern mathematics and so on, which obviously uses, doesn't use Roman numerals, it uses Arab, so-called Arabic numerals and so on. And there are many other examples. And so even in these um, European languages, there are many words which originate from the Arabic language, which were brought to Europe by these North African conquerors. And some of the North African conquerors were, they were Arab speaking, Arabic speaking, but they again came from different parts of, of North Africa. Some some were Berbers, some were, the, anyway, there were different, the whole hundreds of years of these different governments. So, as you say, this history is also suppressed um, and not well known and needs to be uh, much better known. Some of it will be contained in um, histories written in Arabic as well as in other, in other languages. And so, yes, all of that can be, can be and should be looked at. And it, it um, relates to the other thing you said about history and how history is presented because it's often presented in a very limited way which doesn't allow us to appreciate the full significance of things and the importance of things. So understanding the interrelationship between the histories of Africa, particularly North Africa and Europe, North Africa and West Africa, North Africa and East Africa, the, the histories, interconnectedness of the entire African continent, all these things need to be brought out in the kind of history that we that we present. So I think that's, that's um, very, very important. Then your question on um, immigration, migration, and so on. I mean, it, it really depends how people are organized. If you look at things historically, um, just to give an example of the Manchester Congress, most of the people who organized that Congress were migrants. There were people who came to Britain from somewhere else. They came from the Caribbean or they came from Africa. They happened to be in Britain because they were studying or because they were training to do something or just because they were there as political activists and they took advantage of their position at the heart of the empire to, to organize themselves. So, um, And that has happened after that time and ever since but it's the key thing is um the key thing is our people being organized there are in in britain today or in france today or in anywhere in europe today there are many many more people from the african continent now than there were 100 years ago or 50 years ago and so on and or 200 years ago but the, the issue is how are they organizing themselves. Some are organizing themselves very effectively um, in pan-African organizations, um, in Britain, in France, in other places, on a variety of issues. For example, on one of the things, again, I mentioned in the book is the um, global movement for African reparations. So you could say some of the maybe leading reparations activists are to be found here in the US, in Britain, in other places, as well as in the African continent and in the Caribbean and so on, having different approaches, different views, but united in a common aim. So I think it's how people organize themselves, how, they inter how we interconnect with each other, discuss things, 
organize ourselves than these networks which have always existed or certainly for the last few hundred years can be very very effective but it depends on how we organize ourselves how we talk to each other how we discuss um yes the the if the effectiveness it's not a question of numbers necessarily but what we do with those numbers i think that's the crucial thing and then your i can't what was your question again i've forgotten now <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think again, we look around the world and we see those struggles. Um, obviously, at the moment, the struggle in Palestine is assuming uh, significance, but there are many struggles within the African continent. As I mentioned earlier, we've had revolutionary struggles breaking out in Sudan, in Egypt, in recent years, in Tunisia, in many many places people rising up trying to organize themselves sometimes very effectively you know in uh, just a few years ago we were talking about a revolution in egypt but then what happened to that revolution so again what that shows us is it's not just the ability to rise up to organize but then what happens what more is required but i think the key thing is what are the um, you know, the problems confronting people generally. Um, so the, the economic crisis is very intense. So we just look at the US, for example, very intense. The political crisis is very intense. So even the, the powers that be are struggling um, to work out how to manage things, shall we say. Um, so economic crisis, political crisis, um, obviously always cultural crisis. So people, generally speaking, want something different uh, and not very easily persuaded that what exists is it, that, that, that this is it. And that's true in the US, it's true in Britain, it's true in all the African countries generally. People want change. They want uh, the basic things of life that are required to live in the 21st century, you know, education, health, electricity, water, all the things that they know that they are creating by their labor every day. Um, one of the things that we see in Africa is the development of these economies. One of the things that people always emphasize is that the emergence of this new so-called middle class and so on but the the question is how is this wealth being created and who creates it um, and that's always a question that economists always say have different views on but um, I think that uh, I understand anyway that wealth is created by those who who increase value or those who add value to those who increase value. So it's those who produce that value that actually produce all the wealth in the, the world. But are they in a position to decide what happens to that wealth? That's the crucial question. And normally they're not, or we're not. Um, and that forces people to continue to demand change because not having that control leads to all these other problems that you can be in a country with one of the greatest economies in the world where people are sleeping rough on the streets or people can't afford to be ed to educate themselves without going into debt or um, people don't have you know reasonable pensions or people don't have free health care people don't have free you don't have free education let alone free health care how is that possible when there's so much wealth around. So these are the kinds of questions which continually are forcing people to engage in struggle in this country, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and so on. Um, but the, the, the key thing is how to resolve all these things. That's the difficulty. It's not the difficulty of being in struggle. People are in struggle everywhere. 
but how to resolve them in our favor that's where the difficulty is but history shows that everything changes and that um, that these struggles can be successful so to answer your question I'm always optimistic um, I think there are great possibilities and it's always for us to try and play our role to move things forward move things in the right direction and I think if we have that optimism that understanding of history um, that yeah there are very great possibilities so in the future yes of course why not and I think that was a beautiful note to close on um, before we officially close I want to pass it back over to you if there's any words you'd like to leave us with um, closing words well I think uh, as I said that um, pan-Africanism is, is not a thing as such it's something which has undergone change and will undergo change um, and it's about people uniting to solve the particular problems that confront them that doesn't mean that only Africans should unite to solve problems um, everybody should unite to solve problems obviously there are particular problems within Africa but those problems are very often caused by actors external to the African continent, the US, Britain, France, China, wherever. And so even to solve those problems within the continent also requires people in other countries to, it, it requires a kind of joint struggle to solve these problems. Um, I remember once being in uh, Havana, and I heard a speech by Fidel, which is quite a good analogy. He said the world is like a, a ship, and that ship is sailing along, uh, but in great danger. And he said that in this ship, the there are a handful of people in first-class cabins with all modern conveniences, all the food and drink and everything that they can consume. But the vast majority of people on this ship live below decks with an existence very similar to that that existed during the time of transatlantic human trafficking. So he said, unless the people below decks rise up and take over the helm of the ship, it will hit an iceberg and sink so if you like that analogy gives us an idea of what's going on in the world and the need for everybody to unite to solve these problems that confront the world and if we take over the helm then all the problems environmental political economic cultural spiritual and so on all these things can be addressed it's the existing systems that prevent us resolving all of these problems and so our task is to take over the helm and steer the ship thank you that reminds me of my favorite quote what is it socialism or barbarism do we take over the ship or we all sink damn it i'm not trying to sink um thank you so much uh hakeem and rahel can we get a, a round of applause um Thank you all so much for joining us today. I want to just make a quick plug. If you're interested, the book is available downstairs at 1804 Books, also with your most recent book, Money Struggles, and my personal favorite, Pan-Africanism and Communism. It is such a good book. I hope you guys get to read it. Uh, yeah. You signed my copy. You don't remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So definitely check out. Um, and also... Uh, keep in touch with you as uh, you and your comrades struggle for, for the, you know, the erasure of history and African history that you're really waging a fight on, not just for your own case, but the larger case of history and the, the right to keep our history. So thank you for that. I hope you all uh, keep in touch. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.